Morning, everybody. From the uh, welcome to this, the Dutch Barge Association Painting Your Barge webinar, brought to you by Haven Knox Johnston, with our guests from International Paints. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to our two speakers. We have Angus Hewitt, the UK Country Manager for Axo Nobel Yacht Coatings, and Ed Warren, the Strategic Account Manager of Axo Nobel Yacht Coatings. Got it right the second day. Um, uh, but and thank you to both of them so much for agreeing to come and talk to you, talk to all of us about um, about about paint. And without further ado, over to you guys. Thank you very much. Morning, all. Um, thank you very Morning. much to. Uh... To, to Mike and the Dutch Barge Association for having us along and to um, Haven Knox Johnson for organizing and putting this together. Um, so thank you. Um, and uh, without further ado, we'll skip on to the, the start of our presentation and uh, Ed will take the lead on that. Thanks. Thank you, I guess. Uh, apologies for the slight delay there. So um, the, the presentation is about 20 minutes, half an hour or so. Um, and then obviously time for questions at the end. Um, we'll briefly look at what is yacht paint um, before we get into the, the, the main part of the, the presentation um, regarding preparation, and product choice and, and, and application and things like that. Um, but first there's a, there's, a, there's a brief slide on, on Axe Nobel Yacht Coatings. Um, so you'll, you'll probably be well aware of um, one of our brands international, which is probably available in in most boatyards and, and chandries across the world it's it's been around for 140 years um hopefully it's well trusted and, and respected by by everyone who who uses it out there um and we're you know constantly um evolving and, and advancing our, our products to to meet our customers needs so what is yacht paint so why do we paint boats well the, the main reason is is usually to to protect them as a, as a starting point um any sub substrate will degrade over time if it's not protected uh, a grp hull with a with a gel coat will will fade um steel will corrode and, and wood will rot so we use coatings and paints to, to protect those items so that we can we can make them last uh, the other reason is we want things to look good we want them to be aesthetically pleasing um, and we can we can do that with with top coats. We can we can apply a nice finish to a yacht, so it looks nice. Um, and and a byproduct of that really is a is a smooth painted surface is easy to clean, um, and especially with underwater areas. Um, but it, it it is applicable to to top coats in some applications. Um, a nice smooth surface is is more efficient um, and, and can reduce running costs. So what is paint? Paint is a liquid material that can be applied to a surface which dries, cures or hardens to a continuous film that covers the surface. Um, yacht paints are, are quite unique in the environment that they, they have to work in. They have to be formulated to, to withstand water, salts and, and high levels of UV. Um, and another consideration in their formulation is they, they have to have some degree of flexibility because all substrates that boats are made from move, be it steel, GRP or, or wood, uh, there's an element of movement there that, that they need to deal with. So the requirements for your paints are, are quite unique and, and they definitely differ from, from other coatings out there that are sometimes perceived as being quite similar. So, you know, paints formulated for other uses are, are unlikely to be suitable for, for use in the marine environment. Um, Yacht paints are formulated using specifically selected ingredients. We don't use any water sensitive ingredients. There's, there's something we'll, we'll touch on slightly later with epoxies that, 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 isn't, um, that, that, that can cause an issue. Um, but it does mean that other types of paint usually are not, are not suitable for use in marine environments. Um, I'm also aware there's a question um, that we've been sent in about using automotive touch up paints on, on barges. So we'll, we'll cover that in a bit more detail when we, when we get to the Q&A part of the talk. Um, your product uh, are all tested, the systems are tested together and, and they work. Um, and especially for, for some products such as anti-foulings, you know, they have to conform and be registered with, with various regulations to, to allow their use. So there's, there's quite a lot of things that, that go into formulating your pants and, and coating systems to use in marine environments. 
where will you find our finishes? So, so Action Bell in the UK um, have two brands, International, that you're probably all aware of. Um, International is, is, is a DIY to sort of small pro range. It gives you top coats and anti-foulings and all the primers to go with it. There's varnishes as well in that range um, and some internal products for, for bilges and things like that. We've then also got All Grip. Um, it's often perceived as a, as a super yacht top coat, but it, it, it is used on, on, on many smaller boats to give great finishes. It, it provides top coats and primers, um, some interior products as well. Um, and it, it is more aimed at the, at the, at the pro market. Um, so it's, it's not something you're going to see on Chandra shelves, but it is most definitely a product that we, we offer. Okay, so the, the, the next part of the talk is, is really going to look at um, why we need to protect steel in a bit more detail. So we're going to look at corrosion first. So corrosion of steel is usually described by its results. Um, you, you might call it rust, oxidization, scaling, pitting. It's, it's what you see. That's, that's the result of corrosion. Um, corrosion is the reverse process of steel production. Steel is produced by taking an ore, commonly something like iron oxide. You subject it to a large amount of energy to extract the iron from the ore. And the resulting product is naturally unstable. So when the correct conditions occur, the iron tries to convert back to its more stable form of, of iron oxide. Uh, and a mild carbon steel is 98 to 99% iron. So it's, it's quite apt an unstable substrate, um, which is why we need to protect it. So this, this diagram is an example of a, of a corrosion cell. So you've, you've got the, the, the centerpiece of that diagram, which is, which is marked as iron, but it, it could easily be a, a sheet of steel. Um, all corrosion of iron or steel at ambient temperatures is an electrochemical process. And simply put, this means that ions and electrons transfer across a surface, which implies the generation of a current. Both electrons through the metallic conductor, so, so in this case, the surface of the, the iron or, or the steel, and the ions which travel through the electrolyte carry the corrosion current. So the electrolyte in this case is, is, is water, and, and generally electrolytes are, are water-based. Um, the greater the current flow in a corrosion circuit, um, the greater the loss of material. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the elements that, that can increase that as, as we go through. So looking at the, the, the four main parts of a corrosion cell, you've got the anodic site. This is the part of the metal that corrodes. The metal that dissolves does so in the form of positively charged ions. Electrons generated are conducted to the cathode. The anode is the location on the surface where oxidization takes place. So the cathode is the more noble region of the metal where electrons from the anode are consumed. The, the reaction which occurs at the cathode ionizes the electrolyte to form hydrogen and hydroxyl ions. These combine with dissolved metals to form compounds such as ferrous hydroxide, which, which later reacts to become iron oxide or, or rust. The metallic pathway is, is the metal itself. Uh, across a sheet of metal, you'll have anodic and cathodic sites. They can be as, as small as a pinhead. So you won't find that a sheet of metal is either anodic or cathodic, cathodic it will be both across the whole surface. Um, and then there's the electrolyte. And the electrolyte is the medium that uh, conducts the ionic current. Um, an electrolyte is required to transport the ions for oxidization to occur. So steel has three of the four elements um, of a corrosion cell just by being a piece of steel, it has anodic sites, cathodic sites, and a metallic pathway. So you only need to add an electrolyte to, to close the cell and allow corrosion to take place. If you add chemical salts to the electrolyte, this makes the electrolyte more efficient. So in marine environments, sodium chloride is present in the water. Um, I know we're talking about Dutch barges. Um, so you might think that, that fresh water potentially isn't as corrosive as, as salt water. And it might not be, but you've also got to think about other sulfates that are present, such as nitrates that you get from car engines and, and fertilizers that, that, are, that make their ways into the, into the waterways. So why do we 
prepare steel? Well, the most obvious one, we're talking about uh, starting a, a renovation project is, is to remove rust. We don't want to be painting directly on to rust. Uh, it tends to be flaky and not well adhered to the surface. Um, and, and it's, it's rough and it's not going to look very nice if, if you put paint over the top of it. More, more of an issue on new steel is, is something called mill scale. Um, this is blue and black layers of iron oxide. Um, mill scale is electrically positive in, in relation to the iron or steel and is therefore cathodic. So it sets up a corrosion cell if you if you get moisture on the on the on the steel um, just by sitting on the surface. So it, it promotes um, corrosion of, of, of the steel plate at that point. So we don't want to be painting over mill scale. Um, we don't want to paint over an active corrosion cell. So we want that to be removed before we, we paint onto it. The other reason is create a surface profile. So coatings adhere in a, in a couple of ways. They can adhere chemically uh, and they can adhere mechanically. So to get mechanical adhesion, you need to create a profile for the, the paint to grip onto. Um, most primers you'll find on the data sheets that um, they, they give you uh, a surface profile to, to adhere to. Um, and you can measure that uh, using digital or analog gauges, something called replica tape or visual comparator. So the image there um, is, a, is a representation of uh, the, the, the Swedish standards um, for abrasive blast cleaning. So you're probably all aware of the term SA two and a half. So that's a visual standard that we would grip blast steel to. Um, and it's to nearly clean metal. There's a, there's a definition that goes with it, but it, it is up to you to, to look at that and determine whether it's been cleaned to that level. There are other comparators for hand tool preparation. Um, so it's not, it's not all about grip blasting. And most of our data sheet will give you information on, on the surface profile that, that's required, um, either to a visual comparator or also as you'll see there, it's just popped up in the bottom corner. There's, there's actually a measurement and that's the sort of measurement you would look at to, to gauge with a, with a digital or analog profile gauge. Um, th this slide uh, shows one of the reasons why it's Im important to, to adhere to coating manufacturers' recommendations for film thicknesses. So um, all coatings will eventually let moisture through. And what we're trying to do is create a barrier um, that's, that's hard for the moisture to penetrate to the substrate. Um, but it will always find a way through eventually. So it's, it's worth noting on data sheets what the, um, what the film thicknesses are that are required, um, because those have been well thought out to, to, to give the coating its, its performance. We're going to have a look at some some common failures that, that you might see um, when you're you're looking at uh, doing a refit. Um, so the first photo is a, is of a, of a tow rail, and you can see that we've got some some rust appearing through the through the coating there. So that the main reason for, for, for that failure is is probably a low film build um, or holidays in the coating. So moisture has been able to penetrate through and, and that's completed the corrosion cell and, and rust has, has then appeared. Um, the other thing now it is it is kind of related to low film builds, but the paint will naturally pull away from a from a sharp or hard edge. So you can see there that the majority of the corrosion is is closer to the edge of that product and paint will naturally pull away from a hard edge through surface tension. So Again, you've, you've got low film build as it, as it pulls away. So when you're coating areas like that, it's worth paying attention and making sure you are getting the correct film build on those areas. The other thing you'll notice is, is the weld at the bottom there. I think what I'm looking at is some, is some rust spots appearing on there. And that's probably because the welds weren't prepared correctly. Um, welds can be quite, quite tricky to get, a, to get a profile on. So you'll, you'll, you'll probably find that there's some adhesion failures there. So the second picture, um, you've got a handrail and there's, uh, there's some rust appearing on the, on the bottom edge of that handrail. So 
when that was coated, I would expect that was a hard area to access for the applicator. And you'll, you'll probably find that, that there's some low film on the, on the bottom of that handrail. So again, moisture has been able to, to penetrate through the coating. Um, and also in service, because that's a, a nice round handrail, water will track down and probably hang on that bottom edge. Uh, but while it's hanging there, it, it gives it an opportunity to, to again, uh, penetrate into the coating and, and cause that to, to fail. So here we've got a picture of a, of a window. Um, and you can see that just, just at the top of the window that the coatings began to blister and you've got what looks like a couple of rust spots appearing on, on the edge of those cracks. Potentially, you know, that window's not fitted correctly um, and you're allowing moisture to, to get in under the, under the lip there and, and again, complete the, the corrosion cell and that's, that's blowing the coating off. Um, it could also be the sealant or, or gasket has failed. And again, it's, it's moisture ingress that's, that's causing that issue. So these two pictures are, are from a, a hull of a boat. Um, this is uh, an, an epoxy coating. Um, you'll see on the on the picture on the left, you've you've got rust appearing on on that on that weld line. Um, my thoughts would be again low film build. Um, the paint can pull away from hard edges. I believe looking at that picture, there's there's a there's probably a sharp edge where where that join is. Um, and again, the weld not prepared correctly. Uh, the second photo um, is, is on a flat surface. Uh, again, most likely causes would be low film build or holidays in the, in the coating. So this is quite an interesting picture. This is of, a, of an intercoat adhesion failure. So the, the red color you can see there is a primer, the, the black is a top coat, and you can also see some, some rust coming through in the, in the bottom right hand corner. So why do we get intercoat adhesion failures? Well, one of the common reasons is missed overcoating windows. So if a, if a coating has been, it's been left too long and then not sanded and the top coat's been applied over the, over the top of it, um, you don't get that chemical and mechanical adhesion um, and eventually the, the coating can fail. Um, you can get failures like this if, if the coatings are incompatible. So, they, they don't work together. You, you may see intercoat adhesion failures. Contamination is, is quite a, a common one, um, especially if you've, you've put a primer on, uh, you've then let that cure. Some other work has been done uh, on the boat or near the boat and, uh, and contamination has, has landed on the primer before you've put the top coat on. You can then see intercoat adhesion failures from, from that. Um, and and Aging coatings, UV deterioration over time, as, as coatings age and degrade, um, they, they can fail. And, and that may be what you're seeing there. So this, this image looks similar to the last one, but this is actually a, a substrate adhesion failure. So you can see the, the black top coat. And, and if you look closely, there is still some red primer there. And, and the brown area is, is the substrate then, which, is, which has begun to rust. So common reasons for substrate adhesion failures include poor surface preparation. So if you've, if you've not removed that rust uh, prior to coating, if you've not created a profile, um, the, the, the primer doesn't adhere correctly to the substrate and, and subsequently fails. Unsuitable primer or, or no primer, um, that, that can also cause this sort of failure. And, and moisture ingress. As we've discussed earlier, over time, moisture will ingress into coatings and, and can cause failures such as this. I think the most likely cause for this one, looking at that image, is, is probably impact damage. But again, heat or impact damage can cause the, the primer to fail from, from the substrate. So we're going to have a look at. Um, types of application um, and product selection. Um, we're going to start with above the waterline and then we'll move to below the waterline product. Um, so just a quick note on preparing existing coating systems, uh, a, a brief checklist of, of what to do. Note which areas need attention. Um, if you're 
overcoating or you've got intercoat adhesion failures, sand to hard points, um, key the surface, that would be all over and including uh, preparing any areas back to the substrate. You would then be degreasing using a primer and applying a top coat. And there's a note there as well to make sure you've got the correct PPE as a minimum, protective clothing, goggles and gloves, uh, and, a, and a decent dust mask. The, the, the mask shown there is just a little irritant mask, but it's worth having a look on, on data sheets and, and making sure you're using the correct um, mask for the work. And if, if you're not sure, definitely definitely ask people what you, you should be using to, to protect yourself. So most of our DIY product range is, is designed for brush and roller application. Um, and one of the key points to, to getting a good finish using a brush and roller is, 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 the, is the quality of, of, of the brush and roller. So don't go and buy a, a, a basic uh, mohair roller from, from my life being you. Um, use, a, use a decent quality foam roller from a chandlery. Um, you can also get solvent specific rollers. Um, there, there, was, there was an image there of, of a roller from a Dulux decorator center, which I've, which I've tried before and, and works really well. You find that the roller doesn't degrade after a period of time because it's designed to work with the solvents. Um, and the same with, with, using, a, with using a brush. Um, make sure you use a good, good quality brush. That will definitely improve the, the finish of your, of your project. So spraying. Um, some products uh, are only spray applied. So if we take a product like Interzone 954, which is an epoxy, um, which you use as a, as a hull blacking, um, that has to be applied by an airless or an air assisted airless pump, which you can see in the, in the middle picture there. Um, these pumps uh, run at sort of 2000 to 3000 PSI, um, which can be quite dangerous. So that's really a professional application only product. The image on the left is a, is a gravity cup gun. Um, these are suitable for, for primer and top coat application. Um, but again, this is, this is more for, for professional application only. Our product range that you buy in Chandra's is, is designed for brush and roller application. So with those products, there's, a, there's no advantage to, to putting them through a spray gun. And in fact, in some cases, you'll, you'll get a worse finish because they're, they're just not designed to be applied in that way. And please don't be tempted uh, to pick up something like this from your local screw fix uh, and run any of our product through that. You, you will not get a good job trying to apply products that way. So, ready to paint. So we're going to imagine it's the, it's the beginning of January, the boat's out of the water. Um, Saturday morning, you've, you've gone down to the boat with the intention of getting some paint on. But what's the temperature? So the average daily temperatures in the UK uh, for January, we have highs of eight and lows of one degree C. The majority of our products require ambient air temperatures of between 10 and 35 degrees C and substrate temperatures uh, of, of, of pretty much the same, 10 to 35 degrees C. So we need to be careful when we're, we're doing projects in the winter that we're, we're not trying to apply coatings in, in, in ambient temperatures that are, that are too cold. It's worth also noting, although not something we, we really struggle with in this country, but higher temperatures can also cause problems. Um, Surface temperatures that are too high um, will cause the paint to skin over and trap solvents. You also find that pot lives are reduced, so you, you struggle to, to get the paint on. It, it's not something we, we generally struggle with, but, but worth noting if, if the temperatures in the summer are sort of up above 30, 35 degrees, um, you do need to be aware of that. What about humidity? Um, humidity needs to be somewhere between 60 and 85 degrees. Um, one of the one of the products that, that that suffers with high humidities are epoxies and polyurethane coatings. Some of the uh, ingredients in there are moisture sensitive, 
and especially with epoxies, um, you can find that the, 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 the resins react with the moisture on their surface. And that can cause something called amine bloom. Um, and that would then need to be removed before putting another coat on. If, if you left something like that on the surface, you, you would get an intercoat adhesion failure in the, in the future. So linked to temperature and humidity is, is the dew point. So the dew point is the temperature at which moisture condenses. When humid air com comes into contact with cooler air or a cooler surface, the water vapor turns into water droplets. And when this occurs on a surface, this is known as the, the dew point. So you don't want water droplets forming on the, the surface that you're about to paint or forming on the paint that you've just painted on the surface. So the key to the dew point is making sure that your substrate temperature is a minimum of three degrees Celsius or six degrees Fahrenheit above the dew point. There are a number of ways of working it out. There are some very funny analog things that you spin around and do a calculation on and, and that tells you the dew point. Um, or you can get climate clocks, um, which will give you all of that information. It will tell you your temperature and your humidity and, and your dew point. Um, and it's worth investing in one of those if you're if you're thinking of doing any painting projects in the in the winter. And the other thing to consider is the overcoating window. If you start your job, can you finish it? Do you need to overcoat the same day or will you be able to come back tomorrow and overcoat? And if you can't, what do you need to do about that? So you may need to sand between coats or you may need to do it a different day so that you can, you can get your paint on when you need to. Um, most paint manufacturers' data sheets will, will give you information on overcoating windows. And it's worth noting that they do change depending on the, the temperatures that you're, you're applying them in. So something to consider before starting a project. And what about product selection? So what do we mean by single pack or one pack or, or two pack systems? Well, we're really talking about the base chemistry of the paint here. So single pack paints are usually alkyd based, but they may have other elements in them. So you'll see there, there's an image of our top black plus, that's, that's a silicon alkyd. Um, some of our competitors uh, have monourethane alkyds. And, and we do this to provide other desirable properties to the, to the product. Two pack paints such as Perfection or Perfection Pro there are polyurethanes. And you'll also find some, some polyester urethanes out there as well. Two packs are usually seen as the, as the best option. Um, so what are the advantages to them? Well, they, they, they can be quick drying. They, they give you a durable hard finish. It's weather, chemical and UV resistant. And you get great long-term performance with, with good color retention. The disadvantages um, to, to polyurethanes is they're more complex to use. You've got to mix a mix a base and a hardener in a, in a specific ratio. Um, and if, if you get that wrong, you can have issues with, with curing. Um, you also tend to need to apply them by spray, although there are some products which, which can be rolled on. Um, and they contain isocyanates, which means you need uh, a higher level of PPE and they're a little bit more difficult with, with safe handling and, and things like that. So what about single pack products? There, there, there are some advantages to using those then. So they're simpler to use. You, you don't have to use a hardener. Most are designed to be applied by brush and roller. Uh, they're, they're less toxic. They don't have isocyanates in, so your, your PPE requirements are lower. Um, and cost. Um, single pack products tend to be a bit, a bit cheaper. And, and alkyd paints can still provide hard, durable finishes um, that can give long service lives. So they're definitely, definitely worth considering. So what about DIY or, or professional application? Why would, you, why would you choose one one over the other? Well, DIY application tends to, to open up other product choices to you. Um, specifically with, with colors, if, if you look at our DIY yacht range, you're, you're limited to a, to a fixed color range. It's quite extensive, but, but that is the, the range of colors. If you go for professional application, you, you can get much more color choices and you can get metallic or pearlescent finishes. 
um, which you, you can't get from a from an off-the-shelf product. Um, and you you get access to to other products in the range, as, as we said, we've talked about um, polyesterurethanes and, and things like that, that that are for professional application only. Um, primers. So for, for steel, you've you've got a, a couple of options. Um, you can use epoxy primers um, to give you um, the anti-corrosive protection you require. That's it's probably what most people go for in that situation. Um, we also, an international, do a do a single pack product, um, which was called Yacht Primer. Uh, that contained an aluminium flake, which which created an anti corrosive protective barrier. Uh, we've actually changed that product to a to a to a single system now called, called One Up, which combines a, a primer and an undercoat. And we'll, well, there'll be a brief slide on that. I think it's potentially the next slide. Uh, again, the undercoat, um, undercoat selection really is related to your, your top coat selection. Your, your undercoat has to match the top coat and vice versa. If you're, if you're using a, a single pack product, you're, you're probably gonna use a single pack undercoat. And if you're using a two pack product, you're gonna use the, the correct two pack undercoat to, to go with it. And again, the, the, the top coat selection is, is gonna be made on, on whether you're DIY or professional application and, and what you want to achieve with that with that product. So this is um, this is a brief slide showing typical schemes of our our single pack systems. Um, I'm only really going to talk about the the, the, the steel system because um, that's that's relevant to you. Um, so why have international moved from from a primer and undercoat to a to a single primer undercoat? So it's it's a time saving. Reduced number of coats. We've, we've dropped from four coats of primer and undercoat to three. Um, so it's a, it's a cost saving. Um, there's no reduction in, in protection or quality of finish. Um, it's, it's easier to apply and easier to sand. And there's some health and safety benefits. It's, it's lower VOCs and, and eco free. So we're going to have a look at below the waterline. Um, Below the waterline protection for inland waterways comes down to, to three options. At one end of the scale, you've got a bitumen-based coating such as Intertuff 16. Um, it requires one to two year maintenance, um, but it's, it's low cost and, and effective. The other end of the scale, you've got Interzone 954, which is a product we've mentioned before. So this is a professional application only epoxy coating. Um, but it, that can give a service life of, of five to ten years. But obviously, it's it's more expensive in, in terms of the product and, and application costs, and and that has to be be weighed up with the benefits of of yearly lift outs to check the hull anodes and skim fittings. Um, if you if you're going to be doing that, do you need to top up the backing every year, or or are you happy with with five to ten years of protection? So. so there's, There's a few, few options, options there for below the waterline. And, and the, the other thing to you note know, is, is, is anti-foulings. Anti I'm aware that the Dutch, Dutch barges often venture outside of the, of the inland waterways and, 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 and into salt water. So, so you, you might, might want to consider whether you want to put an anti-fouling on the bottom of the boat. Um, even after a couple of days in salt water, you can find fouling appearing, and that's, that's going to have a detrimental effect on performance and therefore fuel costs. Um, so it may be that if you've got some longer trips planned, um, you want to consider applying an anti fouling to the, to the bottom of the boat. So that's the, the end of the talk um, in terms of the slides. Um, I'm assuming there's a few questions coming in. I haven't actually got the, the box open, but draw the pool up to us, and then we can we can start answering. Thanks, Ed. That was uh, thank you very much for all of that. That was really interesting, and I hope everybody found um, found something useful out of all of that. Um, no, loads of questions coming in. Um, both there were some that were pre-submitted, obviously. So let's uh, let's kick off with a Q and A. First one then, um, my question is on the right anti-foul, sorry, my screen's just moved. Um, 
Right anti foul for use on the French canals for my steel hulled Linson. My reading of the forums and magazines confuses me. Some say you don't need to anti foul, whereas others say use a hard anti foul and renew every three to five years. Can you guys make a recommendation, particularly of a paint I can buy in France rather than hauling five to 10 litres across from Newcastle in England? So, yes, anti fouling French waterways. Um, yes, you can certainly use Ultra 300 um, and what's available in, in France, a, a hard anti-fouling is ideal. Um, you find that um, you'll be able to give that a scrub should you get some weed sticking to it. Um, over, over that kind of three to five years, what you will get is you will get sediment and basically inert mud sticking to the surface, which will then start to have a little bit of um, algae growing on it. So it will look like it's fouled, um, but you can just scrub that if you use hard anti-fouling. Okay. Fantastic, thank you, Angus. Um, next one, uh, this one has been sent in. We've heard all about the proper ways to do painting. However, sometimes we just want to do a quick patch up after bumping a lock wall or similar. One option I've heard about is to have a spray can of automotive paint on the appropriate color of the appropriate color, sorry. No brushes, no turps, no cleanup. Is that okay? Or can you suggest any other methods for quick, convenient touch-ups? Um, yes, well, th there's a couple of issues with um, with that one. Um, first off, it's, it's not a bad idea. Uh, if you're looking for a color and a cosmetic match and you want it to just look good for a few months, uh, until you get round to repairing all the bits, then there shouldn't be too much of a problem. But one thing to consider is um, when you go to recoat that area, is what you're going to put on top of it going to be compatible or cause a problem or a reaction between the coatings? Generally speaking, um, automotive spray can products are not in the same family group as uh, marine and yacht products. Um, and also you're not getting any anti-corrosive properties out of a, a, a gloss aerosol can. Um, but short term, purely for cosmetic quick fix, uh, not, not too much of an issue. It won't last long though. <laughs> Brilliant. Th thanks, Angus. Um, and how is it best to prepare steel by hand? as a DIYer for both small and larger repairs, uh, as a DIYer, sorry. Hopefully, Hopefully I'm not, I'm I'm not echoing. echoing. Um, the, the best, best way, way to prepare, prepare hand by, to, to prepare, prepare steel, steel by hand as a DIYer is, is, is usually with, 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 a, with a grinder or something, or something like that to, 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 to knock off any, any, any rust, rust that you've, you've, you've got, got on there. And, and that will also give you some, some sort of surface profile as well. Okay, and is there anything you can do to stop the paint pulling away from sharp edges? How do we make sure there is enough paint in these areas? So, um, I, mean, I mean, the, <laughs> the best, best way, way to make sure it doesn't pull, pull away from the sharp, sharp edges is to, is to put a round on it. Now, now that's, that's not something we can we can really do. do. Um, but, but what, what you could, could what, what you could always do is put, put an extra coat, coat on on, on that, that edge, so, so you. You, you know, know it's, it's going to pull away, away so, you so you pay extra, extra attention. attention. And, and if, if your, your, your scheme, scheme says three coats, you, you put a fourth coat on to make sure you, you get, get enough film build, build on that. there. Fantastic, thank you. Um, is um, Sorry if I've missed this, but what is the difference between putting blacking under the waterline compared to anti-fouling? I'll take that one. Um, purely... Blacking has no, um, no biocide and no effect on anything trying to grow on it. Anti-fouling has, has biocides added to it to deter growth. And that's the major difference between the two. And also the blacking has <clears throat> anti-corrosive properties and a, and a barrier. Um, it does provide a barrier to water vapor and oxygen reaching the metal surface, anti-fouling doesn't. So anti-fouling can't be included in your, in your film thickness for your anti-corrosive 
um, treatment. Oh, that's very useful to know. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so a little bit of somebody's just come in with they've had international gloss paint put into a spray can for not too much cost. So there's a bit of bit of a comment on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, well, well done. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, there's we obviously can't recommend that because it then puts the product outside of our, our regulatory affairs and um, the reach regulations because it, it puts it into an aerosol. Um, I, I think virtually all products that are sold in a can um, will not have gone through the reach regulations for being put into an aerosol. So that is on your own head, but um, <laughs> it, it's quite useful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, yes, we can't. Um can't recommend things that aren't sort of that, that, that aren't sort of supplied by the manufacturer but um next one what is your opinion on rust converters like furtan they are often recommended on forums and through word of mouth ed you've got a lot to say about that one <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll, I'll, on that. I'll, I'll try I'll i've turned my speakers down so hopefully it, it, it doesn't, doesn't echo too, too badly, badly and people can, can hear, hear me so, so yeah, yeah there, there, there are a lot of rust converters out there. Um, they, they supposedly convert rust to, to inert and insoluble products. Um, the manufacturers claim these, these products adhere tightly to, 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 to the steel and, and they form a protective barrier moving forwards. Um, there, there, there's a lot of published literature out there that shows us that this isn't, this isn't correct. And actually, um, these products can't completely penetrate the, the rust on the surface. Um, that, that's, that's quite an unlikely thing to happen. happen. So, so what, what you might find is um, you, you you still have active corrosion underneath the surface, although to, to you it looks like you've, you've solved the problem. Um, these, these products aren't film forming. Um, they're, they're, they're not going to, to seal or bind together, together the steel. Um, so you, you're, you're going to be left with, with, with something that maybe, maybe on the surface is inert, but it, it can still be flaky and it's, it's not going to be, be solid. solid. Um, the, the, the other issue I have is, is how much do you do you apply and how do you work that out? Um, you, you, you might find you, you apply too much and you're then left with, with an acid on the surface um, that you've not completely washed off when you try to to, to apply a product over the top, top you, you, you get, get a reaction. Um, so, so our recommendation would always be if you've if, if you've got rust, you need to deal with it correctly. And, and, and a quick solution like a rust converter is, is not the answer. If, if it was and it, and it worked, I'm sure that we would we would have one in our range. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. Well made, Angus. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, um... Uh, no, I was just going to reiterate Ed's comment that um, you, you probably won't find many paint manufacturers. I can't think of any of the major players that, that produce a rust converter and include it in part of their coating schedule and specification, but um, that might tell you something. Yeah, it says, it says quite a lot. Thank you for that. Um, any tips on achieving the best finish by brush? Yes. Um, Rolling and tipping is is the kind of default chosen one by by all the professionals that don't don't spray. So when we talk about rolling and tipping, you, you use a foam roller um, to get the paint on the surface and spread the paint on the surface, and then you use a brush to take out any any small bubbles and just level off before um, bringing it to flow and, and level out itself. The, the recommendation is, is you, you know, use as good a quality as brush as you can afford and as large a brush as you can, you can handle um, and use a, a, a single stroke, either top to bottom or, or left to right, but continue with the same method all the way down the side of the vessel um, at a 45 degree angle. So you're, you're kind of going along like, like that and tipping off, um, not too much pressure, uh, and just enough to to affect the surface and then just leave it. The more you go over the surface and mess around with the brush, the more solvent you lose out of the surface and the, the stickier it becomes and the less flow you get. So you want to roll it on 
uh, fairly sharpish and tip off and then leave it. Cool. Oh, that's, that's, that's very useful. Um, if you've had your hull painted with two pack epoxy, do you need to blast back to bare metal after 10 years to reapply or can you maintain a well adhered epoxy coating? If so, how? That's probably two parts in that one for you there. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, so um, nothing, first comment really is nothing, nothing really lasts forever. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to, to actually know just how much lifespan is left in uh, a steel coating. Um, you know, 10 years is, is, is a, good, a good lifespan. Um, if everything is looking fine and you've not got a, a large percentage of scabby detachment and corrosion appearing, then you know there's there's no reason why you need to go and strip it all off just out of out of a, a habit or a or a feeling that you need to be routine about it. Um, you know your first indication of, of a failing coating in the, on a steel vessel is going to be corrosion. Uh, um, and that should be fairly obvious. Once you get to sort of more than more, it then becomes a, a sort of economic decision as to instead of chasing damage, do you just go and get the whole area blasted and, and recoat? Um, but you know you do have to bear in mind that that coatings don't last forever, and there will come a point where you know it could be fairly fairly sudden that it it all starts to degrade within the space of a couple of years um, when it's 14, 15 years old. But that, that does depend, it is variable. Fantastic. Um, another question come in. I've been painting my barge for the last seven years with good results, but last year there were areas that showed up matte. Any thoughts? Um, the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest contributor to loss of gloss is usually a combination of temperature and humidity. Um, sometimes you can feel like the weather's nice, um, the humidity can be very high, and the temperature difference between, this, as, as Ed pointed out earlier, the dew point. Um, and it's not just the dew point when you apply the paint, it's also the dew point during the cure process. So if a coating takes, um, if it's losing solvent over 12, 24 hours, um, you can paint it on like just now, when you've got 12 degrees centigrade. And then as it drops down overnight to, to two degrees or three degrees, you'll wake up in the morning and find that the gloss has vanished because the humidity has been high, the temperature's dropped down and that's ruined the gloss. And it can also turn up patchy because of what's behind the steel. So if you have areas where there's um, cold spots, where there's a cabin or a cold area or a locker or something, then that piece of steel might be colder than, than other parts. And then you're, you're noticing a blotchiness to it. But that's where you're, where you're teetering on the edge of dew point that can cause that. It doesn't wreck the coating uh, really in its performance. It, it's really just the gloss that you're, you're noticing. So it's really a scratch and recoat um, or overcoat again within the overcoating window. Fantastic. Um, any tips on choosing a good applicator of going professional? What questions should should you be asking? Um, you should be asking, what are their preparation methods? Are they are they sort of, you know, if you go and get a quote quotes from a few places, you'll begin to build a feel for what people what what service people are offering. Um, also, do, do they recommend the manufact paint manufacturer's specification. So if they if they tell you that they're going to apply X, Y, and Z, um, is that what the actual manufacturer recommends as well? Do the do the manufacturer's recommendations meet with the applicator's recommendations? If they're far apart, then you question why are they so far apart? Why are they recommending, say, for example, half the number of coats of primer? Um, you know that that would be the alarm bells. Um, word of mouth um, locally is always a good thing. You know, talk to people uh, in, in the in the near boatyard, find out who's had their boat done 
you know, a few years ago, see what it looks like. Um, you know, all, all the usual, the usual sort of routes for, for, for sussing someone out, um, I think would be the main, the main thing. I mean, the other, the other thing is this is one of the sort of this is this is sort of where the balancing point of modern technology is as well, isn't it? Because you can go onto Google, get reviews, look up their their feedback, see, you know, go to other association members like within the Dutch Barge Association if they've yeah. used them before and all that sort of thing. So you can yeah. you can usually get quite a lot of uh, a lot of information online about um, about each and every every person out there. So um, that's another that's another avenue to keep an eye on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many coats are recommended for the underwater line products into tough question mark into, into tough 16 is probably what, what yeah. Ian's asking about there um, so rolled coats you're probably looking at five coats um, again going back to, to, to Ed's earlier presentation if you apply one coat with a roller um, under a magnifying glass or a, a microscope, you'll find there will be holes in that coating. Um, so the number of coats does, does two things. It helps to build up the film thickness, uh, which ultimately you want to be um, around about 250 microns dry film thickness. So that's a quarter of a millimeter dry film as a, as a minimum. Uh, and it also makes sure that you have more opportunity to fill in those Fill in those gaps, those those little holidays in the coating surface, uh, where you you might have missed it or gone a bit light. Um, you can guarantee that if somebody rolls a rolls paint on a on a on a large surface, you will have areas that will be twice as thick as others. And if you do five rounds, you average out, and hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed, you will you will have covered it enough. I love that phrase, holidays in the painting surface. That's fantastic. I'm going to use that one. Um, yeah. <laughs> does it matter if I put a two pack or a single pack over existing paint? If yes, how do I find out what is there if I didn't paint it? Right, okay. So that is a, a fairly common um, thing to come across. Uh, the normal thing is to take the, take the most aggressive solvent for the two part paint put it on a cloth and a rub test and see what comes off. Normally the, the solvent that you use in a two-part paint won't touch the, the two-part product once it's all cured. However, it will work a little bit like paint stripper on a single part paint. Uh, and it, it, it is it's the only way you can really, really tell um, whether you're going to have a problem or not. Um, but but the main reason is that the the solvents in two part products are far more cutting and uh, aggressive than single part products. Fantastic. And finally, uh, how is it best to remove paint above the waterline, e.g., paint stripper or anything like that? Don't do what I do and drive it into a lock and scrape it down the side to remove quite a large chunk of paint. How would you do it normally? Um, normally. Um, Paint strippers are—they're not—they're um, not the greatest. They're very messy and actually far more time-consuming than you you realise. Um, dependent on the size of the area, smaller areas can be done with with sanding equipment. Um, you can do you can use um, grip blasting. Is the is a professional sort of preferred route that gets you straight back to bare steel with a profile. Um, all the way through to sanding or disking. Um, obviously, if you're sanding, you want to be conscious of the mess that you might make and, and what you put over other people's boats. Um, but yeah, the, the, the paint stripper is um, okay to a point, but it's, you're probably going to use spend a lot more time on that than you are um, sanding it off or, or, or disking it off. Cool. Just one, just one last question um, that's literally just come in. Can you paint single pack over two pack painted service? Yes, yes, you can. It's um, the other way around. You can't do it or something, wasn't it? It's the other way around that you can't. Yeah. So if you think of a two pack as being aggressive and more like a paint stripper, 
that's the way to, to think of it. Um, the thing about putting a single pack paint over a two pack paint is you're going to need a fairly good mechanical key and adhesion. So you, you will want to sand it sort of 240 grade uh, thereabouts, 240, 320. Angus, Ed, fantastic. A huge thank you from, from, from all of us for sharing your time, knowledge, expertise, all that sort of stuff. It's been really interesting. And I hope everybody on the call has found it interesting too. Um, and so, well, we know how they have because there's been some really good questions coming through. But um, just a couple of last little minutes last little uh, adverts for me on monday morning at 11 o'clock we ha haven Oxford johnson are doing another webinar on spring checks which was filmed on vial 2 which is charlie mclaren's uh, dutch barge on the thames so anyone who wants to join that it's monday morning at 11 o'clock i think mike you've shared it all on the forums and on the dba website um and it's all it's all there all the details so yes please join in and see Charlie's boat and all the advice. Fantastic. And, and then obviously we're doing a series of these webinars. If any of you have any subjects that you'd like us to cover, send them into Mike. He'll send them on to me and we'll see what we can set up. It'll be uh, hopefully hopefully we can get some subjects in for later on in the year that, 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 that will really sort of excite everybody. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to pass over to Mike. Um, thank you very much. No, thank you, Paul, and thank you particularly to Ed and Angus for all of the content that we've had today and last night in UK time, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining. It's been um, a really interesting uh, session, um, and yes, we'll get that up, uh, the recording, and posted so that it's there for posterity and everyone can view it at their leisure, and look forward to more. Um, so please, ideas, any topics, anything anybody's interested in, um, getting set up and hopefully Paul will be able to pull that together as part of this series. Thanks for doing that, uh, Paul, for Haven Knox Johnson and thank you, uh, International Paints and everybody else for taking part today and thank you for being here. You're welcome and thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you very much.